Tonsillectomy is one of the commonest surgeries done in ENT. Either alone or in combination with an adenoidectomy. Usually in children, we do adenotonsillectomy in a single sitting. In this class, I will explain tonsillectomy under the headings of Surgical Anatomy of Tonsil, Indications, Contraindications of Tonsillectomy and the Surgical Techniques of Tonsillectomy. Uh, there are so many techniques and the commonest one we uh, prefer to do is a dissection and snare method that will be explained and the postoperative care and also the complications. The tonsils are otherwise called the faucial tonsils or the palatine tonsil. And where is it situated? It is situated in the oropharynx. Um, if I draw the oropharynx here, there will be the uh, free border of soft palate, uvula, then uh, anterior pillar, and here comes the uh, tongue which is again divided into an posterior one third and an anterior two third. This part is the oral cavity which includes the tongue and this is the oropharynx which forms the superiorly by the free border of soft palate and then the uvula. Uh, there are two pillars also. This is the anterior pillar from palate from superiorly palate up to the tongue that comes the Palatoglossus, okay, that is palatoglossal uh, muscle and the posterior pillar, one goes posterior to this, okay, so that is towards the posterior pharyngeal wall, so that forms the palatopharyngeus muscle, okay, so anterior pillar is formed by the palatoglossus muscle and posterior pillar is formed by the palatopharyngeus muscle, you can uh, remember the name, uh, thinking of the relations. Okay, and in between this anterior pillar and the posterior pillar lies the tonsil. So that is the location. There are two uh, palatine tonsils, and they are situated in the tonsillar fossa that is formed by in the oropharynx between the anterior pillar formed by the palatoglossus and the posterior pillar formed by the palatopharyngeus muscle. And when it gets hypertrophied. It becomes like this. Okay. In hypertrophy, you cannot see the posterior pillars. Development of tonsil is from the second pharyngeal pouch. This is lined by non keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. It is non keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. And uh, it is lying on a tonsillar bed, which is mainly formed by two muscles. One is a styloglossus, this one. This is from uh, lateral to medial. From this area to this area. Okay, from here to here. So, first comes the styloglossus muscle. So, it is a usual MCQ. The bed of tonsil is formed mainly by the styloglossus muscle. And this is the superior constrictor. Okay, superior constrictor muscle. And this is the pharyngobasilar fascia. Okay, this one. And inside is the buccopharyngeal fascia. Okay, so pharyngo styloglossus, then the pharyngobasilar fascia, then comes the superior constrictor and the buccopharyngeal fascia. A well developed capsule on the lateral surface. This is a lateral, when you come from lateral to medial, this is a lateral surface and this is a medial. Medially it is irregular and turned into multiple crypts and the largest crypt is called the crypta magna and uh, uh, so laterally it has got a uh, capsule okay and in between this capsule and this superior constrictor there is a loose areolar tissue in this part here is a loose areolar tissue actually this loose areolar tissue help you to get a correct plane during tonsillectomy and you have to dissect the tonsil from the tonsillar bed in the plane of this loose areolar tissue then the dissection will be easy uh, and also bleeding will be less and in this loose areolar tissue uh, this is a site of collection of pus in case of a uh, peritonsillar abscess or quincy okay so that is the importance of this loose areolar tissue one it is a plane of dissection in a tonsillectomy 
and second it is a site of collection of pus in a Quincy or a peritonsillar abscess. This is the diagrammatic representation of the bed of tonsil. Uh, and next important thing during surgery and also in exams you will be asked for short note or drawing label that is the arterial supply of tonsil. And the main arterial supply, main artery supply in the tonsil is tonsillar branch of facial artery. So from the external carotid artery, okay, external carotid artery, facial artery arises and it is given two branches to uh, tonsil. One is tonsillar artery, so this is facial and from the facial there are two, one is the tonsillar. So tonsillar artery is the main arterial supply and the commonest arterial cause of bleeding during tonsillectomy. And the other branch which supplies the tonsil is an ascending palatine branch of facial artery. This is the ascending palatine. So you have the uh, tonsillar branch of facial and also ascending palatine. You can think it like that. Here comes the palate. So ascending palatine. So if there is an ascending palatine artery, there should be a descending palatine also. Isn't it? So next uh, you can think in that way. So descending palatine artery is a branch of maxillary artery. That also supplies the tonsil. So here comes the maxillary division. From the maxillary artery. There is a descending palatine also. Okay. So that is descending palatine. So ascending palatine is a branch of facial and descending palatine is a branch of maxillary artery. The arterial supply is from the... Here what, what, uh, what is the structure coming here? That is a uh, tongue. So otherwise we call it as a lingual. Lingual. So lingual artery. It's a branch of again. It's a branch of external carotid. So, lingual artery comes and supplies here through dorsalis linguae arteries. Okay, dorsalis linguae branches from the lingual artery. Dorsalis linguae. Okay, so towards the tongue there is a lingual artery. Then tonsillar branch of facial, ascending palatine branch of facial and descending palatine branch of maxillary artery. One more artery that is the ascending pharyngeal. This ascending pharyngeal artery is a branch again from the external carotid. There comes the ascending pharyngeal. Right? So the tonsillar branch of ascending pharyngeal artery. There is no, there is no descending pharyngeal artery. Ascending and descending palatine is there, but ascending pharyngeal only, no descending pharyngeal. So, this is in short the arterial supply of tonsil, the lingual artery through dorsalis linguae, facial, the tonsillar branch, and also the ascending palatine branch, and the tonsillar uh, branch of facial artery is the main arterial supply to the tonsil. And there is also descending palatine maxillary artery and also ascending pharyngeal branch of a tonsillar branch of ascending pharyngeal artery which is all these are branches of external carotid. Right? So this is important. And another thing you have to remember is that this tonsillar branch of facial artery is only the arterial cause, the commonest arterial cause of bleeding during tonsillectomy. But the commonest cause of bleeding during tonsillectomy is not arterial and it is venous. Right? Here there is a paratonsillar vein. Okay. Paratonsillar vein. Otherwise called the, what is the structure here? It is a palate. Right? So it is a, otherwise called the descending palatine vein. Otherwise called Dennis Brown way. Right? So, this paratonsillar way, 
otherwise the uh, descend, uh, descending palatine vein or the Dennis Brown vein is the commonest uh, cause of bleeding or commonest uh, site of bleeding in case of a tonsillectomy. That you have to remember. So this is regarding the arterial supply and the venous drainage. And another thing is that external carotid artery is the uh, blood supply or arterial supply and around 1 inch lateral to the uh, tonsil lies the internal carotid artery and internal carotid aneurysms can present as a pulsatile tonsillar swelling or also, uh, and also it can mimic the uh, peritonsillar abscess, internal carotid artery. That is why in all cases of uh, queen C or a peritonsillar abscess, before putting the incision, you have to go for an uh, uh, aspiration of the um, swelling. Because one of the differential diagnoses of QNC or the peritonsillar abscess is internal carotid artery aneurysm. So always go for an aspiration at the site before going for an incision and drainage. And another important relation which lies um, in the lateral part that is the posterior to the tonsil. Posterior lateral to the tonsil there are two important structures. One is in styloid process and another one is a glossopharyngeal nerve. You can feel the styloid process um, lateral to the posterior pillar of tonsil. Okay. And also after tonsillectomy and also after a peritonsillar abscess drainage, the patient may complain of earache. Why it is so? It is due to the glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Irritation of the glossopharyngeal nerve after the surgical procedure. And uh, tonsillectomy is the approach for an excision of elongated styloid process and also glossopharyngeal neurectomy. And uh, what about the lymphatic drainage? The tonsils has no afferent lymphatics. And the tonsillar node is the jugulodigastric lymph node. Okay. Or the JD node. Jugulodigastric lymph node. Where is it situated? Just below and behind the angle of mandible. You can palpate it on your uh, neck. Below and behind the angle of mandible lies a jugulodigastric lymph node. And it is enlarged, uh, non-tender in case of a chronic tonsillitis. And when you get an acute tonsillitis, this uh, JD node will be tender. Okay, it is one of the classical uh, sign of a Tons, uh, acute tonsillitis. You get an enlarged and a tender jugulodigastric lymph node. Uh, so that is all about uh, surgical anatomy. Next is the indications. For all surgery, we have to divide the indications into absolute and relative. For tonsillectomy, there are only uh, few absolute indications. And uh, one is chronic tonsillitis. What is the criteria to call it as a chronic tonsillitis? So, one, more than six episodes in the current year or five episodes in the preceding two years. In each year, there should have a minimum of five episodes and three episodes in the preceding three years. Okay, so in the current year, six or more episodes. In the preceding two years, five episodes. And in the preceding 3 years, minimum of 3 episodes. Then it becomes a chronic tonsillitis. And along with that, there should be um, signs of tonsillitis at each time. Okay. The patient cannot come and tell as I, have, I am having chronic tonsillitis. And the second is tonsillar hypertrophy causing oropharyngeal problems. Problem with uh, uh, swallowing or with voice. That is oropharyngeal problem or obstructive sleep apnea. Hypertrophy tonsil causing and problems in the oropharyngeal uh, um, area and also obstructive sleep apnea. And the third uh, indication, absolute indication, biopsy for malignancy tonsil. both for taking biopsy and also as a part of treatment, as a part of uh, treatment procedure of proven malignancies of the oropharynx. Okay, so both therapeutic and diagnostic indication. So these are the absolute uh, indications for tonsillectomy 
and if the relative indications there are so many relative indications the relative uh, indication there is a long list uh, I am only enumerating the important ones one is a, a second attack of QNC peritonsular absence second attack or uh, along with for febrile seizures chronic uh, tonsillitis causing febrile seizures you can go for a tonsillectomy and uh, long term management of Ig and nephropathy ok then recurrent sore throat there should be in criteria are there and this criteria should be satisfied for recurrent sore throat if you are planning for a tonsillectomy all these symptoms should be there for minimum of one year and this uh, um, because of the sore throat and tonsillitis the patient is not able to do the routine works if the four, four criteria that is one thing the sore throat should be due to tonsillitis second uh, it should be there for minimum of one year and the sore throat and tonsillitis minimum of five attacks in that year five or six attacks and this should prevent normal functions uh, of the patient then only you go for uh, tons uh, tonsillectomy in case of recurrent sore throat then all these are non-tonsillar indications that is usually asked in exams in viva the non-tonsillar indications of tonsillectomy that is as an um, approach to elongated styloid process then glossopharyngeal neuralgia the glossopharyngeal neurectomy then as a part of complex excision of a brachial fistula and uvulopalatopharyngoplasty UPPP ok uvulopalatopharyngoplasty as part of treatment of an obstructive sleep apnea so these four are the non-tonsillar indications of tonsillectomy and also we do it for diphtheria carriers and as a treatment of tonsillar lith especially the unilateral tonsillectomy done for tonsillar stone or tonsillar lith and if you tell about the unilateral tonsillar enlargement then in exam they will ask you about the causes of an unilateral enlargement of tonsil so uh, enlargement of the tonsil only on one side can be due to mainly the lymphomas both uh, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma then metastasis think in that way only one tonsil is enlarged or there is an asymmetrical enlargement so one is an lymphomas then uh, leukemia then metastasis then infective conditions mainly actinomycosis and candidiasis then again uh, peritonsillar abscess or quincy then this tonsillolith then parapharyngeal spaces uh, lateral to this tonsillar area so parapharyngeal tumors or parapharyngeal uh, abscess will push the tonsils medially so that will also cause an unilateral enlargement ok so unilateral enlargement of tonsils are due to mainly lymphomas both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's leukemias then infective condition actinomycosis and candidial uh, infections mainly then to uh, conditions of the parapharyngeal area that's parapharyngeal tumors and parapharyngeal abscess again a peritonsillar abscess and in the contraindications these are the absolute contraindications one is an epidemic of polio why in the it's not done in the epidemic of polio because uh, this polio will come and concentrate in the tonsil as well as in the uh, lymphoid tissue during an epidemic even in normal individuals and if you do a tonsillectomy at that time this polio virus get disseminated into the bloodstream and will cause a paralytic polio that is why it is uh, it's an absolute contraindication and acute tonsillitis and also a recent upper respiratory infection minimum of three weeks of time is given if there is a symptoms of uh, upper respiratory infection or an acute tonsillitis these are the uh, absolute contraindications and all others as uh, I have already told along with adenoidectomy like a uh, hemoglobin level less than 10 gram percentage or um, other systemic conditions uncontrolled diabetes hypertension all those conditions you can uh, include in along with the contraindications for tonsillectomy also and in surgical techniques there are so many techniques for tonsillectomy and standard textbook divide it into dissection methods and non-dissection methods ok some textbooks tell it as cold and hot methods also and uh, the preferred one is dissection and snare method uh, which is practicing worldwide nowadays and this guillotine method is an abandoned one so often non-dissection they have the guillotine tonsillectomy and also intracapsular partial tonsillectomy 
and both are the cold method. Cold method means there is no production of uh, heat within the tonsil or on the instrument. And in the cold method, dissection and snare method, which, will, uh, which I will uh, describe here stepwise. Diathermy, we use monopolar or bipolar cautery or uh, bipolar scissors are used. Radio frequency, otherwise called electrosurgery. And also uh, the cooperation works in the same uh, principle. Harmonic scalpel method, which is again a cold method. And in laser, there are laser tonsillectomy, which is a hot method. We use carbon dioxide, KTP and also uh, ND AG laser and also cryosurgery. Of all these, this uh, non-dissection technique, then cryosurgery and dissection and snare method and also this harmonic scalpel. They are the cold method and all others are hot methods of tonsillectomy. And now I will uh, describe about the dissection and snare method. And uh, I told you for a surgical procedure, we have to start from anesthesia. Uh, so, anesthesia and position is the same as I have already described along with the adenoidectomy. So, please see the uh, video on adenoidectomy for further details. Uh, general anesthesia with the orotracheal intubation. For tonsillectomy alone, if you are planning a tonsillectomy alone without adenoidectomy, especially in adult, you can go for a nasotracheal intubation also. Uh, position is rosa's position. And in the procedure or the steps, there are again, as in adenoidectomy, here also there are named instruments which can be asked in work. These are the uh, names of main instruments used for uh, tonsillectomy and uh, a rose's position, mouth opened with Boyle Davis mouth gag uh, with a um, dotted tongue blade and uh, stabilized with the Traffin Bipods and Magoran's plate. Uh, for that details, please see the uh, uh, video on adenoidectomy. And now the mouth is opened. You see the uh, hypertrophied tonsils. This green colored are the tonsils. Patient like a proper positioning and opening the mouth. So this is the uvula. Uh, These are the two tonsils, hypertrophy tonsils. Suppose hypertrophy tonsil. You take the first one is a Dennis Brown tonsil holding forceps. Uh, Pull the tonsil, uh, catch hold of the tonsil and uh, pull it in this direction. That is downwards and medial. Okay. So then what happened? These tonsils will come out of the or it project out from the tonsil abit. Right? Actually there is a, this is an anterior pillar and in the, if it is a hypertrophy tonsil you cannot see the posterior pillar. So, from the anterior pillar, there is a fold of mucosa coming into the tonsils, joining with the tonsillar capsule. So, while pulling it downwards and medially, this mucosa will stretch out. So, you have to, uh, you have to put the incision at the reflection of mucosa from the anterior pillar. This is the anterior pillar. Reflection of mucosa from the anterior pillar to the tonsil. So, you pull it and put the incision here. With what instrument you put the incision? You put the incision with the was long dissection forceps um, with tooth. See, this is the one. Was long dissection forceps and you can see the tooth here, single one. Okay, so you pull the uh, tonsil with the Dennis Brown tonsil holding forceps and put an in, uh, incision. Where will you put the incision? At the uh, reflection of mucosa from the anterior pillar to the tonsil. Midway between, this is the upper pole and this is the lower pole. So midway between the upper pole and the lower pole, you put the incision. Then extend the incision downwards and upwards. Okay. So after this, you have to extend the incision downwards and upwards and if there is a um, fold of mucosa then cut it using scissors order. I have uh, I am catching hold of the uh, tonsil with Dennis Brown tonsil only forceps I put the incision with the uh, was long dissection uh, forceps with tooth and extend the incision downwards and uh, upwards and if there is a fold of mucosa here I will Cut it with scissors. Then it is very easy. 
Now we have to dissect the tonsil from the tonsillar bed. I have also to, uh, already told you that the tonsillar bed, between the tonsillar bed and the superior constrictor, there is a loose areola tissue. So if we go in that plane, the dissection will be very easy. So again catch hold of this and take the Mollison's tonsillar dissector. See, one end there is a tonsillar dissector here and in another end there is an anterior pillar retractor. With this you can retract the pillar, especially during uh, to, for ligation or cauterization of the bleeding point. For inspection of the tonsillar fossa, you have to retract the anterior pillar. And this end is the tonsillar dissector. So using this small essence, tonsillar dissector come anterior pillar retractor, you dissect the tonsil so that it will come out. It will come out. You dissect it, you dissect it, you dissect it until you reach the lower pole. Okay, so when you reach the uh, lower pole, And when you reach the lower pole, it will be like this. So, you dissect it, dissect it and you will reach an area now. See, you have reached the lower pole. This is your tonsil. You have reached the lower pole. And when you reach the lower pole, you have to take the Eve's tonsillar snare. And this is uh, Eve's tonsillar snare. You can see it here. And uh, there is a wire at one end. This is a stainless steel piano wire and with this, once you reach the lower pole, okay, take it out and uh, put the uh, Dennis Brown tonsil holding forceps through this and you introduce it, introduce it till you reach the, uh, you catch hold of this and then introduce it till you reach the lower pedicle and in the lower pedicle, uh, uh, Lower pedicle will be inside this. Then you crush it and after crushing, for cutting, take out the uh, your uh, fingers out of this and then cut it. Okay, so that your tonsils will be out. Right? So this is uh, Eve's tonsillar snare and with this we crush and then cut the tissue. So that the other type of crushing, the thromboplastins will be released which will go to the um, uh, bloodstream and will reduce the bleeding. Okay, so that is the advantage. It crushes and then cuts. So that is the advantage. For crushing, you have to uh, keep your fingers inside and for cutting, you have to take it out. And then, see, this is cutting. So this is Eve's tonsillar snare. You have to remember the uh, stainless steel wire, the size of stainless steel wire and also the advantages of this will be asked in bio. So that is how you have to do a uh, tonsillectomy by dissection and snare method. So tonsil, holding with tonsil, then putting the incision with uh, was long dissection force with tooth, then dissecting the tonsil with Morrison's uh, dissector compiler retractor and finally on reaching the lower pole, Using the east tonsillar snare, the tonsils are out. Then another question, what are the structures passing through the lower pedicle? That is often asked in exam. And there are three structures which are passing through the uh, lower uh, One, I already told, there is an artery. That is dorsalis lingui, branch of lingual artery. So that is the dorsalis lingui artery. Then one fold is there. What is that? Triangular fold. In the upper pole you have the semilunar fold and in the lower pole you have the triangular fold. Okay. So triangular fold of mucosa. And also you have some lymphatics. Right? Okay. So these are the structures passing through the lower pedicle of tonsil on which you put the east tonsillar snare. And everything is repeated on the other side also. Here also do the same and take out the tonsils. Okay. After this, you have to look for any breeding points in the tonsillar fossa. For, for that, you can use this, this end. That is a pillar retractor end of uh, son of Molly, that Mollison's tonsillar dissector. 
and uh, retract it. Look for any bleeding point. If there is bleeding point, catch hold of that. Either you can use the uh, straightened um, curved artery forceps and tight instrument. It is named as Negus Knot Pusher. See the end. It is end is like this. So the uh, knot or the tie can be put inside this and you can push the knot to that. Because if your fingers are not reaching up to the uh, tonsillar fossa, you can use this knot pusher to push the knot and tie there. Okay. So that is Negus knot pusher. Sometimes in exam, this will be confused with the uh, Ballinger swell knife. Swell knife is also like this, but at the in swell knife, that is Ballinger's swell knife. Where it is used? It is used in uh, submucous resection of the septum. It was described along with my class on nasal septal surgeries. So, that should not be confused with nasal knot pusher. For swell knife, there is a rotating knife at the end of this. This is only a slit here. See? So this is Negus knot pusher, not this one, this one. Okay. And I am erasing the swell knife, otherwise you will confuse it here also. And the uh, suction tip used here is Younger's suction tip. This Yanger's uh, suction is again is a long and uh, large one like this, so that it will it has got a uh, long tip also, so the blood we can suck it through this, is right? So these are the this is how you do a tonsillectomy. Get confused is between these two instruments. This used in tonsillectomy, a Dennis Brown tonsil holding forceps. But this one is lux forceps. Okay, that is different. For taking punch biopsy or uh, taking some tissue from inside the nose, etc. Use lux, tons, uh, lux forceps. And this is Dennis Brown tonsil holding forceps. You should not, uh, you should not confuse between these two. Uh, this is lux forceps. And here you can see that the end is sharp. Okay, the area to hold the tissue it's sharp here it is not at all atraumatic because we should not got uh, traumatize the tonsil see one here it is cutting edges for lux forceps and this lux forceps has got a box joint this joint is called box joint and this is only in tonsil holding forceps this is only a simple joint here it is a box joint that is the difference between these two okay so should not get confused with the Dennis Brown tonsil holding forceps with lux forceps. Once the procedure is over, next comes the post-operative care. It is similar to that of positioning, that is a, a coma position and monitoring. All are same as that of adenoidectomy. Coming to the complications, it can be divided into immediate, intermediate and delayed as we have done in adenoidectomy. So the immediate complications can be during surgery or immediately after surgery within the first 24 hours. Okay. Uh, that can be due to anesthesia or due to surgery. Due to anesthesia, it can be at the time of surgery, it can be due to uh, drug allergies or uh, hypertension or can go to the level of cardiac arrest or immediate post-op, it can be a nausea, vomiting, then airway spasm. Especially if there is uh, signs of an airway obstruction, look for any dislodged clot or any uh, pack. Especially if you are doing an adenotonsillectomy, look for the forgotten nasopharyngeal pack. That's very important. And along surgery, the one is the bleeding. Um, that is a primary hemorrhage. Uh, improper dissection then uh, presence of infection and also the bleeding disorders are the cause of excessive primary hem hemorrhage. So that's a primary hemorrhage during tonsillectomy and the treatment is just uh, ligate the bleeding. 
Minimum bleeding will go with application of uh, pressure and if it is not, go for a tying the uh, bleeding point or like um, either with the uh, ligatures or with electrocautery. Okay. Then what, what injury? There can be chance of injury to the uh, neighboring structures. Neighboring structures can be soft palate or the tongue or the tooth or the uh, posterior pharyngeal wall like that. And then there is chance of a temporomandibular joint dislocation. Especially if you are opening the mouth too wide, there is chance of TM joint dislocation. And in the intermediate comes a reactionary hemorrhage. What is the cause of this reactionary hemorrhage? One is slippage of knot. Okay, if you are ligated a uh, bleeding point at the time of surgery, there can be chance of slippage of the knot. Second, uh, the postoperatively, the child or the uh, patient will uh, excessive struggling or excessive uh, vomiting postoperatively. Or another cause is an, if after uh, general anesthesia, there is a chance of a rebound hypertension that will open up the blood vessels and it will cause bleeding. So. Uh, slippage of knot or uh, excessive retching or the vomiting of the patient in the postoperative period or in uh, rebound hypertension because at the time of recovery from general anesthesia are the causes of this reactionary hemorrhage. And after a uh, routine tonsillectomy around 50 to 80 ml of blood loss will be there for tonsillectomy. If it is associated with adenoidectomy another 40 ml that is around 80 to 120 ml blood loss in case of an adenotonsillectomy. If there is an excessive bleeding and there is excessive bleeding in the uh, as reactionary hemorrhage also then arrange blood and uh, uh, put an IV cannula and uh, stabilize the condition and uh, if there is again there is bleeding then take the uh, patient back to the uh, operation theater and <coughs> tie the bleeding point or use electrocautery. Uh, it is an edema of the uvula. Uh, that is mainly because excessive suction, uh, keeping the suction tip over the uvula. That has to be avoided. And there is, if there is excessive edema of the uvula, there is chance of airway obstruction. So steroids should be added. Excessive pain and autalgia is, uh, will be relieved using NSAIDs. And uh, grave complications like chance of pulmonary embolism and edema. It is a rare, but it is a grave situation. And delayed complication usually in the 5 to 10. Uh, postoperative period 5 to 10 days. One is a secondary hemorrhage that is mainly due to uh, infection of the tonsillar fossa and it is also an emergency. Admit the patient, uh, start on intravenous uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, then uh, trans blood transfusion or plasma according to the uh, uh, blood loss. And if the patient is not, the bleeding is not getting uh, stopped by that. Again, take to um, operation theater under general anesthesia. Uh, then, a delayed complication is a distortion of taste sensation. That is uh, because at the time of surgery, injury get, uh, to the lingual branch of glossopharyngeal now. It can be a temporary phenomena or it can be a permanent. Temporary will resolve completely within six weeks. Young complication, infection, scarring, and another complication, delayed complication, is tonsillar remnant. And also there is chance of hypertrophy of the lingual tonsils. Uh, we have discussed about the surgical anatomy of tonsil, the indication, contraindication, then the steps of uh, surgery with the uh, uh, name of instruments and uh, also the complications. Okay, thank you.